Hello, I'm Chris Hartwell, and welcome to The Heartbeat, the place where I talk about just a few of the things that make this little guy tick. Today, I'm going to be talking about episode 10 of season 2 of HBO's The Leftovers. Hmm. Join me, won't you? All right, per usual, I'm going to be talking about a few of the positives from this week's episode, a few of the negatives, and then wrapping up with what I'm looking forward to next week on The Leftovers. Oh, gosh. Hmm. Okay, before I get all sad and upset over the fact that this show is over, or at least this season is over, let's talk about a few of the positives from this week's episode, because I really do love finales. Not only is it a great time for the revelations to happen and the resolutions and payoffs, but more than that, especially on a Lindelof show, we get these really wonderfully fun intersectings and collisions and team-ups between these different characters, ideas, and desires which has made all the more rewarding on a show like this because we've spent so much of our time laser focused on all these individual characters each episode. And for me, the success of a finale is not only how naturally those different pieces are moved around and tied together, but what's made of them when they are. And again, for me anyways, I feel like Lindelof and company did a really bang up job with this season two finale. And yes, I did say season finale, not series finale, remaining optimistic. Uh, but yes, straight from the outset, we are shown one of the major pieces of the leftover puzzle with a flashback of Evie and her friends saying goodbye to the Murphys and hello to the Garveys. And brief though that moment is, it does highlight something that I really enjoy, which is when flashbacks recontextualize a previously seen moment. And that's a great storytelling device that you can see on display in films like Ocean's Eleven, where we get to see the same moments and sometimes exact same shots as before, but now we're able to understand their full meaning. And in this case, it was lines like, welcome to Miracle, which before we're seen as innocent and just welcoming, we're now seen to be very sarcastic and very cynical. I also really appreciated the moment as the girls were driving away and one of them breaks down and starts to cry. Because for me, that added a really necessary level of reality and balance to this extreme action that they were taking. Because though I'm sure they had given plenty of time and thought to this before doing it, we hadn't been with them for that. And so without that balance, their sudden silence or Evie's abrupt usage of nonverbal communication could have come off as very insincere or even cheesy. And speaking of the overall balance on this show and just how it's kept things from becoming too earnest or even pretentious, I really have to praise the music selection on it. Just the fact that Evie and the girls are listening to Lean On by Major Lazer really does help to connect them to reality. And then whoosh, we are yanked through time, away from that storyline, and on to another one. Something that were this any other Leftovers episode, I would have been a little bummed by, because it could have been great to have a very strong point of view, classic Leftovers story, tracking with those girls for the next 60 minutes. But this being a finale, that just wouldn't make sense. There are far too many characters and far too many plot lines to service. As Lindelof himself has said, premieres and finales have a slightly different set of rules, because you've got a lot to unpack. So being that there are so many disparate storylines in a finale, one of the really important elements is how the writer transitions one to the other. So whether it's the earthquake happening in the past and then cutting to the earthquake happening in the present, or the tragic yet wonderfully humorous moment where Laurie's in Mary's bed going up and down, and then cutting to Mary. Or Nora holding the baby that Tom left on our porch and then panning to Tom himself. Or Kevin telling Michael, I've got to talk to your father. And then cutting to John himself. And speaking of John and that scene, I love how it opens with an exchange between he and Erica. But Erica's never cut to. The shot just holds on John, illustrating just how alone and isolated he actually is. And from there, I really love the reveal of what Evie's present to her father was, along with John and Erica's response to it, because I felt like it said a lot about who those characters were. For Evie anyways, I really felt like it was her way of saying three things to her dad. One, dad, you cannot let things go. Two, dad, just in the same way that me pretending to solve your problem and find this bug and kill it isn't actually helping you, so in the same way, you and mom pretending to be this picture-perfect family isn't helping me. And then three, these are the reasons that I left you guys. I also thought John's initial very touched response demonstrated just how blind he was to this. And finally, Erica's refusal to let him remain blissfully ignorant demonstrated just how bitter she was towards her husband. And with that scene too, I felt like I could really hear Damon once again asking that same question he had all season long, which was, is something meaningful because it's true? Or is it meaningful because it's helpful for our heart and for our mind? But jumping back to the show and the bitter characters in it, I really was pleased with how the Laurie and Jill relationship was handled this go around, even though it really did highlight for me kind of one of my primary gripes for this finale episode, which was there was just so little time to fully service these characters and these relationships that I had fallen in love with over the past 20 episodes. Though, at the same time, it also showcased that Damon really, by and large, was making the wisest steps he could in light of that lack of time. 
that being he wasn't sprinting towards or forcing resolutions that couldn't yet happen. With that said though, I felt like one of the primary casualties of the very finite running time on this episode was just Nora and her relationship with Kevin. Now, don't get me wrong, I did appreciate what they were trying to do with the character, I just felt like some of the devices they used to get there felt a little bit rushed and a little bit uninspired. Like Nora listening to the talk show where the caller's wife was dealing with the exact same issue as her, or the crazy migrant stealing Lily, which forced Nora to own the fact that she wanted this baby, Kevin, and a new family, even if that meant she may lose them just like the first one. Though I really did enjoy the classic Nora response as she picked up that radio, smashed it on the ground and declared, fix that, Jesus, followed by the very ambiguous response, maybe not response, of Mary waking up. And again here I have to say how cool would it have been had we gotten an entire episode with Mary and Matt as they kind of dealt with the repercussions of that awakening and got to kind of confront characters like John. Though at the same time, it was wonderful to have such an unadulterated happy moment on this show, and to have Matt's existence, for a moment anyways, not be so Job-like. And also this was another great instance of both transition and bringing those two characters together, but also placing Nora and the baby in a specific place where their paths could intersect with Tom, really giving him the arc that he had been craving all season long. As I theorized last week, what he longed for more than anything was a way to prove that he wasn't like either of his fathers, both of whom who had let down the families they were responsible for. So here was this baby that he was responsible for, but had abandoned at one point, once again in need of his help and protection. Another of the attempts to get all the characters in the same geographic location was John bringing Kevin back to the kennel where his dog was being kept. And though it was an attempt, it did feel just a little bit forced to me. Though, at the same time, I really loved the scene between the pair of them, and how they were framed through the bars, like they themselves were caged animals. Kevin trapped, and John trying to restrain his own rage and terror. And there really is no better person for Kevin to try and convince of his believed journey to the other side than someone like John. These are the exact type of confrontations I was hoping for coming out of episode 8, because I think they really are true to reality, and what so many people experience when they come up against those who vehemently oppose their own worldview. And also, it stands in great contrast to the earlier scene between Michael and Kevin, where his struggle is not to believe Kevin's story, but understand what the reality of it means to his own faith. And bang! It was so great how unpredictable it was with John shooting Kevin at that point, as well as Meg and the girls showing up on the bridge less than halfway through the episode, because it really gave the writers that edge, making me as the audience member feel like, anything could happen. Where is this episode going? Also, the timing of John shooting Kevin in relation to Evie's appearance really did prove to me that he himself did not believe that she loved him. Speaking of that belief, I've heard certain people criticize how thinly drawn Evie's motivation appears to be for leaving her family and joining the Guilty Remnant, most especially after watching the next scene, where Michael again recontextualizes the story for us and explains how sad and confused Evie was over her father leaving and not being told why. To me, though, that wasn't Lindelof saying that that trauma which she experienced in her childhood was the only motivation behind all that she did, but rather a paradigm for her entire existence, where she is constantly denied answers and honesty from her family. And that's exactly what the amazing scene between Erica and Evie communicated to me on the bridge, starting with that phenomenal shot of Erica sprinting towards her daughter, followed by her muted pleas as she tries to understand what's happened. It's such a powerful moment, one where we don't need to hear Erica's words to understand her pain, confusion, and desperation. And for me, the really heart-wrenching brilliance of that confrontation and connection did kind of make up for the slightly under-explained reason that Evie was on the bridge to begin with. I guess it was Meg's plan to kind of distract the authorities so that the guilty remnant could rally and storm the gates of Jarden. Also, I felt like Meg's master plan was in some ways narratively and visually kind of disconnected from Kevin's return to purgatory or his fractured mind. Though, there is something to be said about the connection between John and Erica losing their family and home, and Kevin fighting to regain his. Which in contrast to his last visit to the other side is exactly what Kevin must do battle to reclaim, awakening in himself all that he has to be thankful for in life. Which, in a few different ways, is actually similar to a couple scenes from the first season. One where Patty quotes poetry, and the other where Kevin reads scripture. With both instances providing a fairly overt statement as to what's going on in these characters' hearts and minds. Which definitely could come off as pretentious or feel like lazy writing, but when it's done in such unique ways, it becomes a whole lot more acceptable to me. I mean, karaoke and purgatory. I don't think I could conceive of anything that's much more out there than that. Also, it did in a really fun way remind me of the great scene from Magnolia where all the characters sing, wise up, 
And wow, Justin Theroux. I mean, he actually was the one that sold that scene at the end of the day. Just the utter vulnerability in his eyes and in the painful clunkiness of his voice. I don't think there was any moments in this entire show where he was that raw and that exposed and naked. And that's saying a lot. And the use of singing continues in that really haunting moment where Meg and Evie reveal to Kevin why they invaded Miracle, which was to prove that those living there weren't saved. They weren't spared. They're not special. And there are no miracles in Miracle. And though Meg and the Guilty Remnants plan did feel a bit rushed and underplayed this season, it ultimately felt like the right way to go. Most especially in the moment where Kevin walks out into what now could be described as a zombie apocalypse version of Jarden, which stood in very intentional and meaningful contrast to the version that we saw at the top of the season. The version that was always there, yet hidden and masked. And then there was that scene that started with Kevin stumbling into the clinic. And my first thought was, ooh, this is a great opportunity for another wonderful scene between he and Erica. But almost the instant that I thought that, my tune changed completely and I was, oh no, this has to be a scene between John and Kevin. Because it's their relationship that still felt the most unresolved and within this episode's reach to do so naturally. So when John walked in, I was practically jumping up and down, yelling at the TV going, please stick the landing on this scene and I really had nothing to worry about. Damon started by expertly beating the audience to saying something like, this is so unrealistic, Kevin would totally be dead, by having the characters voice that exact same doubt. And then he subverted the cheesiness with the beautiful lines like, I killed you. Nope. But more than anything, what makes this scene as beautiful and as powerful as it is, is the fact that it's not about justifying why Kevin is still alive, or further explaining why John's daughter left him, or do miracles happen in Miracle? But it's about these two very different, very broken men connecting in the midst of this very confusing, often unexplainable world, and admitting and acknowledging that as real as the mysteries are, so is their ability to connect with those around them real, and that they are not so different from their fellow travelers in this cosmic drama called life. Just looking at John at the end of the season, he's really being left in a place that was very similar to where Kevin himself had been. For him, it's Evie who's under Meg versus Lori who was under Patty, or his son Michael is off connecting with a very spiritual Virgil in a similar way to Tom's relationship to Holy Wayne, which is something that I believe Kevin recognizes as well and why he's so quick to forgive John for shooting him. And then there was the moment that almost brought me to tears when the cover of the Pixie song kicks in because for so long that was Kevin's tune to bear by himself, but no longer. He and John will bear it together. And then how beautiful was the visual symmetry of John waving goodbye from his porch to this man who, when they were last waving at each other from these exact same spots back in the season premiere, could not have been less connected. Which led right into the next scene, which did bring tears to my eyes. Not just because it was beautiful to see Kevin finally reconnect with his family and get those people back that he had lost, but also because it was allowing the episode to do what the best finales do, which is bookend a season. And in this instance, give further clarity to this seemingly random season opener with the native woman and her child. Because what it told me was, sure, there may be some connection to the rest of the show with the earthquake and the birds and the baby stealing, but what that scene is really about in relation to the rest of the show is the importance of community and the true tragedy of what that woman endured by being cut off from hers. And also that last scene really did instill in me a further desire for this show to continue. Because not only did it tell me, man, I don't know all these characters as well as I want to know them. There's more stories to be told. There's more I can learn about them. But also, it's not as clean or as easy as Kevin walking in, seeing his family, and living happily ever after. An idea that I really do believe both Parada and Lindelof believe as well. Because as they've showed us already in the same way with Nora finding her baby, and by extension a new family at the end of season one didn't suddenly fix everything in her life, neither will this for Kevin. Furthermore, this second season of The Leftovers really did feel personal and important because it was coming from a personal and important place to its creators. Whether it be Damon's kind of interest in the Book of Job or Tom Parada's interest in conspiracies, it was coming from a place that was important to them, and I felt that. So knowing that the both of them want to create a third season and have more stories to tell, bring it on. And the final reason that I want The Leftovers to return can be stated no better than it is by Tom Parada himself when he said, I think one of the things that The Leftovers has taught me is just how much people need stories. And one of the things they need from stories, I think, is to alleviate the anxiety of the human condition. 
Of course, I don't think that stories are the ultimate answer to all of life's problems, nor are they intended to be, but they do encourage us to think and to dig and to uncover more and more things that lead us closer and closer to the truth, which is why I enjoy them so much and which is why I love The Leftovers so very much. But alas, here we are at the end of this video blog journey where I discuss The Leftovers. Um, I just want to end by saying, guys, thank you so, so much for journeying with me on this, uh, for commenting below as much as you have, for challenging me, for encouraging me. It's been a real joy and a real pleasure connecting with you guys in that way. So thank you. Uh, per usual, do comment below though. Let me know what you thought of this final episode. Did it live up to your expectations? Did it tie things together in the ways that you wanted? What would you look forward to seeing in a third season? Please comment below and let me know. Also, please do subscribe. This will not be the last television show that I will review on this channel. And I would love for you to stay up to date on what's coming next. But for now, I'm Chris Hartwell. This is The Heartbeat. Thank you for joining me.